Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm here again today with Jacob and Jed, and we are continuing on with the symposium. So last week, we finally got Socrates back into the dialogue. We've been missing him, but we got him back, and today we're going to continue with his speech. We'll probably also continue with it next week as well. It's, it's a very long speech, and there's quite a bit to talk about here. Um, just as a quick review, let me just um, start the stream here. Just to make sure we're all on the same page and remember some of the highlights of what we saw last week, because these ideas continue on throughout. So after everyone else gave their speeches, Socrates then sort of admonished them all, talking about um, the difference between their appearances of a eulogy and what a true eulogy ought to be. And he says that he was a fool to agree to this. And he talks about the method of a true eulogy. You need to speak the truth. You need to pick out the most beautiful facts and you need to set them in order. And he tells us here that he is the one who knows the truth. And then without going through everything he said here, I just want to point out that he did ask Phaedrus if you have a need for such a speech. He's not going to give the kind of eulogy that they had given. He's only willing to give the true one. And so he asks Phaedrus, do you want him, if Phaedrus wants him to go on? And we had some discussion of whether Socrates was coming from a place of strength or a place of weakness by asking this. And I will leave it to you to um, decide that that was a discussion from last week. He then goes on to question Agathon. And without going through all of it, um, what they concluded was that love is a love of beautiful things and wanting it to continue into the future. And love desires what it lacks. And if it desires beautiful and good things, then it must lack these things. And that was the conclusion of their discussion. Now, you may recall that Agathon dropped the discussion at that point. He just said, let it be as you say. Can't argue with you, Socrates. Socrates allowed him to drop it. He says, I shall let you alone. And he goes on. And then he tells us that he actually had the same conversation himself with his own teacher, Diotima. And so then we saw the transmission analogy that Diotima is to Socrates as Socrates is to Agathon. He says here, and I highlighted it last time, I spoke to her in much the same terms as Agathon addressed just now to me, and she refuted me with the very arguments I have brought against our young friend. And so this is often called like the transmission analogy, because we're seeing how a teaching is transmitted from teacher to student, and then the student, if the student grows into teacher himself, then he transmits it to someone else. However, what we also see here is we see here that Socrates was the middle term there. We also see, though, that the students respond differently, and that means that the teachers are different um, in the sense that Diotima could take Socrates farther than Socrates could take Agathon. Um, you could question if that makes Socrates less of a teacher, but um, one argument in his defense, I would say, this didn't come up last week, but I would just add now, is that if you go back to the introduction, we talked there about how being able to um, explain a conversation such as this one, um, Apollodorus is able to um, transmit the whole teaching as he learned it, that shows his understanding of it. If you're not able to transmit it, then it shows you didn't really understand it. So he at least has understanding, certainly, because um, we... It sounds here very much like he is he able to remember everything Diotima had said to him. There's no point where he says, I can't remember what she said about this. And so we can take that to mean that he remembers it all, which means he at least has understanding. And so the reason he takes Agathon only a small way is because Agathon dropped it. Socrates, on the other hand, asked many questions. And so their conversation is able to go farther. And we took it a little bit farther last time, up until, where did we end off at? 
So we saw that um, love is a not a god, but a great spirit. And we see it here, a great spirit. And I'll highlight that for us. So we saw that um, love is a spirit and desires what he lacks. And we ended on this next page here. Oh, no, I went too far. Sorry. <laughs> we ended here. Um, we saw that um, the spiritual is that between the gods and humans, and it's the means of communication both directions. And then we ended with this line, a very curious line. From what father and mother sprung, I asked. This is Socrates asking. So he's asking questions where Agathon dropped it. And so the conversation goes further, which we're very um, grateful for, I'm sure. Um, thank you, Socrates, for continuing on, because now we get to continue on as well. This is a curious question. What does it mean? What is he really asking Diotima here? What's the origin of love? Good. Yes. In mythology, whenever we talk about parents, it's the causes. And so asking um, who are love's parents means its origin. And then we have this myth, which seems to be Plato's own myth, um, but a very beautiful one and a very useful one, very interesting one. So let's go through the myth. Um, we'll talk a bit about it. And also, I think there's quite a bit of work that we can each do on our own that we need to do on our own um, to really open up this myth. So I'm going to get, let's start with the beginning here. Let's get the setting of it. Okay. She says, this is Diotima speaking, that it's a rather a long story, but still I will tell you. So here's the setting. When Aphrodite was born, the gods made a great feast, and among the company was Resource, the son of cunning. Okay, Resource is um, poros, and in some translations, this is plenty. So it's like plenty or resource. You have an image of like a fullness, right? And Cunning, um, I've seen this translation in other places as well. Um, it's actually Midas, it's uh, Metidos, which would be Midas, the, um, right here, for those of you who know a little Greek. This is the name here. This is Midas, who is often translated as wisdom or intellect. So cunning has a more of a negative image to it. Um, so I wanted to give you that. Um, so resource is the son of Metis. And um, when they had banqueted, there came poverty a begging. And so as you're going through this, you want to be thinking about who are these characters, <laughs> resource and poverty, and what do they represent? And it's a good idea to make a list. This is something that was recommended to me the first time I read this, and I think it's very good advice because it really forces you to do the work yourself and really think about it and internalize it and kind of meditate on it. So we know Aphrodite is beauty, and this is when she was born, not her like fifth birthday or 10th birthday or whatever, but the day she was born. And there's this great feast, so you want to ask yourself, everything in this myth symbolizes something. So the great feast, what does it mean when the gods have a feast? Um, who are these characters, resource and poverty and the other gods? Um, she came a begging as she might in an hour of good cheer, and she hung about the door. So what does it mean that she's hanging in the doorway? Um, now, resource grown tipsy with nectar for wine as yet there was none. By the way, do you both know the significance of nectar in mythology? What is the significance of this line here, that he was drinking nectar because wine as yet there was none? 
Jed, do you know this one? Uh, it's what the gods drink. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder if it has any um, psychoactive properties. Mm, well, we're not going to go there, but um, yeah, nectar is the drink of the gods. And the significance here is that wine is associated with the physical realm. And so to say that wine is yet there was none means that we are beyond the realm of time and space. Um, bringing in psychedelics is bringing in um, something in our realm. So I'm not going to go there. But he had grown tipsy with nectar, and that's different from being drunk on wine. And so you want to, again, think about what does that mean to be tipsy with nectar? And right, he went I, into the garden. Sorry. I'm sorry? Well, uh, the the psychoactive thing was um, I heard that it had some sort of uh, equivalent or reference to um, uh, the experience of the brilliant light of being. So. Uh, there's some association with nectar, um, mm. s sleeplessness, or uh, sometimes it's translated as sleeplessness or eternity, something mm. along those lines. Uh, my memory is, is vague, unfortunately. Yeah, I understand where you're going. Um, the idea of sleeplessness is curious because uh, when he's in the garden and you want to ask yourself also, what is the garden of Zeus? Remember, Zeus is intellect in mythology. Um, there he became overcome with heaviness and he slept. And so what does that mean? And then poverty, being of herself resourceless. Now, I want to clarify here that um, being resourceless has more than one meaning in English. Um, her name is poverty, and so she's empty. So here's what we mean here by resourceless. But we're going to see here that obviously she was very resourceful because she devised a scheme is the very next phrase. So she's, and there's a sense in which she's resourceful, but here the idea of being resourceless means she's empty. She's um, extreme poverty. Penury is another translation I've seen here instead of resourceless. So that's the meaning here. And so being herself um, of extreme poverty, she devised the scheme of having a child by resource. She just lay down by his side. That's all she had to do. And then, boom, she conceived love. And so, obviously, this is not following the, um, this is not something in the physical realm. There's something else going on here. So, you want to think about what is that. And so, this is where love comes from. Love is conceived her, from the parents that are opposites, resource and poverty. And so it has a nature of something in between. And so now what he gives us is some description of, of love being the child of these two opposites. Also notice that she actually entered the garden. She didn't stay in the doorway. And so you want to also think about the significance of that. And you'll also see throughout here that if you go back to the introduction after reading this, after going through this some, it can be interesting to go back to the introduction. There were two introductions. If you look over both of them, you will see various places where there are, there are things which um, you can connect to this myth. So Plato clearly had this myth in mind when he wrote those introductions, like hanging in the doorway or love being the attendant and minister of Aphrodite. What connection does that have to the introduction? And so those are other things to think about. Okay, picking up the description of love. Hence it is that love from the beginning has been attendant and minister to Aphrodite since he was begotten on the day of her birth. Let's make sure we're clear on the definition of the word begotten. One of those biblical words that we've all heard, but uh, what exactly does it mean? I would say conceived. Conceived. Mm, that's the common image. If either of you looked it up? Because actually the word begotten, and also in the Bible as well, is used with men as well as women. 
And I think there is a common image that it means to conceive. And that's why I ask this, because what it actually means is to bring into existence. And so love was not only conceived on the day of her birth, because if he was conceived on this day, he may have been born some later time. He was brought into existence on the day of her birth. And that becomes significant as we go forward. And so the word begotten or to beget is used with men as well as with women, as, as parents. Um, okay, so love comes into existence on the day of Aphrodite's birth. So they're both born on the same day, but Aphrodite a little bit earlier. And so, you know, in mythology, um, the order that people are born or that gods are born signifies their place in the hierarchy. Because, of course, they're all, you know, without beginning or end in it. They're not literally born or die. Um, and by nature, love is a lover bent on beauty, since Aphrodite is beautiful. Now, as the son of resource and poverty, and love is Eros, so male, as the son of resource and poverty, love is in a peculiar case. And so here's the description of love, and it's very different from all the other descriptions that we got in the other speeches. He is ever poor and far from tender or beautiful, as most suppose him. Okay, so very different then from Agathon's description of love being both tender and beautiful. Rather, he is hard and parched, shoeless and homeless, on the bare ground always he lies with no bedding, and he takes his rest on doorsteps and waysides in the open air. True to his mother nat mother's nature, excuse me, he ever dwells with want. And so that's what he gets from his mother. And so you want to get the image of that. And again, you can make a list of these are all the qualities he has from his mother, from his father, and try to put that together. But he takes after his father in scheming for all that is beautiful and good. For he is brave, strenuous, and high-strung, a famous hunter, always weaving some stratagem, desirous and competent of wisdom, throughout life ensuing the truth, a master of jugglery, witchcraft, and artful speech. By birth, He's neither immortal nor mortal. In the selfsame day, he is flourishing and alive at the hour when he is abounding in resource, but at another he is dying, and then reviving again by force of his father's nature. Yet the resources that he gets will ever be ebbing away, so that love is at no time either resourceless or wealthy. And furthermore, he stands midway between wisdom and ignorance. So there is that idea again of being midway. Um, the position is this. Actually, actually, let me stop there for a moment. So that's the myth. Um, and again, I do recommend that you go through this myth. Both of you, also anyone watching on YouTube, I recommend you go through the myth pull out all of the elements of the myth, all of the characters, all of the location, and think about what does this represent? What is this myth telling us about love? Um, before we go on, do either of you have any comments that you'd like to make at this point that you were thinking about when you read the myth? Okay, I just, I well, don't want to, oh, I'm oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I was waiting for Jacob to go first. Um, a famous hunter is interesting because um, the most famous hunter for the Greeks is Apollo. Mm -hmm. And he hits the mark with mm -hmm. the most artful speech, philosophy. And we mentioned that one of the things that Socrates has said he knows 
even though I often see people say that Socrates says the one thing he knows is that he doesn't know anything. Well, one of the things he does know is he has an art. And here he is making a lovely speech. So Apollo, I think, represents, uh, yeah, the, the god of philosophy, able to hit the mark with artful speech. So I thought that was interesting that this is the way that they're describing the, the second part of his nature. The first being in doorways like Socrates at the start and here a famous hunter like Apollo in artful speech. Okay. And, um, okay. And so from here, um, there's a very famous, the very next paragraph here is a rather well-known one um, that Diotima says, the position is this, that no gods ensue wisdom or desire to be made wise, because such they are already, nor does anyone else that is wise ensue it. Okay, so first, the gods don't need to seek wisdom, because if love is what we desire, what we don't have, then the gods wouldn't have this desire for wisdom since they already have it. But there's a problem that the ignorant also don't pursue wisdom. They don't desire to be made wise either. And in this very point is ignorance distressing because when a person who is not, call me beautiful here, actually, um, Kellen, um, is neither beautiful or worthy or intelligence when such a person is satis such a person is satisfied with himself and the person who does not feel himself defective has no desire for that whereof he feels no defect okay so again if we desire what we lack but you don't know that you lack wisdom you're not going to desire it and here just point out to you. Um, back when we uh, talked about the dialogue Alcibiades, I pointed out this Greek word, amathia. And um, it's the word that is translated here as ignorance. There are two Greek words that can mean ignorance, maybe more than two, but there are um, two that we often see. And um, agnoia, is a neutral word that just means to not know something. And there are many things we all don't know. I mean, I don't know how to do brain surgery. I don't know how to fix my refrigerator if it breaks down. And there are many things I just don't know. And it's fine not to know them. Um, but amathia is the negative sort of ignorance. It le means literally not learning. And it's when you choose not to know something or like this kind of double ignorance that it's often called. And so that's what he's talking about here. That um, they not only don't know, but they don't know that they don't know. And so if we only love and desire what we don't have, well, then you have this, there's two ways in which people would not desire wisdom. Either you really do have it, and so you don't need to desire it, or you think you have it. And so you don't desire what you don't realize you're lacking. And so those are the two groups, the two extremes that do not have a love for wisdom. And so Socrates asks, who then, Diotima, are the followers of wisdom? I'm not sure why the translator chose this wording, but this followers of wisdom is literally philosophers. So what he's really asking here is who are the philosophers, if it's neither the wise nor the ignorant. And so this is where their conversation is going to go on from here. And so now they pick up the dialogue again. And so I'm going to ask Jacob and Jed to please um, read for us, make it a dialogue. Um, so uh, Jed, why don't you be um, Socrates for us? And Jacob, could you read Diotima's part? Sure. Okay, so I already read um, Socrates' part here. So who are the philosophers if they're neither the wise, wise nor the ignorant? The ignorant. The Why a child could tell. I'm sorry, you're... Oh, oh no, sorry. sorry yeah. 
<laughs> My bad. No Why a child could tell by this time that they are the intermediate sort, and amongst these also is love. For wisdom has to do with the fairest things, and love is a love directed to what is far, so that love must needs to be a friend of wisdom, and as such must be between wise and ignorant. This, again, is a result of a result for which he has to thank his origin, for while he comes of a wise and resourceful father, his mother is unwise and resourceless. Such, my good Socrates, is the nature of the spirit, that you should have formed your other notion of love is no surprising accident. You supposed, if I am to take your own words as evidence, that the beloved and not the lover was love. This led you, I fancy, to hold that love is all beautiful. The lovable, indeed, is the truly beautiful, tender, perfect, and heaven-blessed. But the lover is of a different type, in accordance with the account I have given. Upon this I observed. Very well, then, madam, you are right. But if love is such as you describe him, of what use is he to mankind? I want to pause here for a moment. Do you understand? So now he's continuing it on. We've been talking about philosophers. And by the way, this friend of wisdom that we saw further up, um, we saw again here, a friend of wisdom. This is also a philosopher in the Greek. Um, so, and, and also this translator uses the word fair to mean beautiful. So wherever you see that, you can just plug in the word beautiful. Um, so here we're looking at philosophers. Now Socrates is asking, okay, so if love is a philosopher and a philosopher for philosophers. How is he useful for everyone else? And so that's where we're going next. That is the next question, Socrates. <laughs> on which I will try to enlighten you, while love is of such nature and origin as I have related, he is also set on beautiful things, as you say. Now, suppose someone were to ask us, in what respect is he love of beautiful things? Socrates and Diotima. But let me put the question more clearly thus. What is the love of the lover of beautiful things? It's a confusing question there. Um, so you've got the lover loves the beloved, three parts. So we've talked about the lover and the beloved, but what exactly is the love? Um, why does the lover want the beautiful object? What is the actual, what's actually going on here? Okay, so what is the love of the lover of beautiful things? We're looking at that activity. Okay. That they may be his. But your answer craves a further query, such as this. What will he have who gets beautiful things? This question, I declared, I was quite unable now to answer offhand. Well... Imagine that the object is changed, and the inquiry is made about the good instead of the beautiful. Come, Socrates, I shall say, what is the love of the lover of good things? That they may be his. And what will he have who gets good things? I can make more shift to answer this. He will be happy. Yes. The happy are happy by acquisition of good things. And we have no more need to ask for what end a man wishes to be happy when such is his wish. The answer seems to be ultimate. Quite true. 
Now, do you suppose this wish or this love to be common to all mankind, or that everyone always wishes to have good things? Or what do you say? Even so, it is common to all. Okay, so here now you can see they brought the conversation from philosophers to all of mankind. And I have to add, the <laughs> translation of happy is good daemon in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, uh, uh, just Go interesting ahead. that uh, we can read happy... And happy seems to make sense as an end in and of itself that doesn't require further explanation. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. the Greeks, also to have a good daemon is similar and mm -hmm. ultimate for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is yes. Very good point. Yes, everyone wow. would want a, a good daemon. Mm. I do. <laughs> Jacob? Yeah, well then. We do not, well, well then, Socrates, we do not mean that all men love when we say that all men love the same things always. We mean that some people love and others do not. I am wondering myself. But you should not wonder, for we have singled out a certain form of love, and applying thereto the name of the whole, we call it love. And there are other names that we commonly abuse. As for example? Take the following. You know that poetry is more than a single thing. For of anything whatever that passes from not being into being, the whole cause is composed or poetry composed, oh, sorry, being the whole cause is composing or poetry so that the productions of all arts are kinds of poetry and their craftsmen are all poets. Wow, that is true. By the way, you may want to go back and compare what he's saying here about poetry to what Agathon said about poetry back at, uh, was it 197A, and it's page 159 in this text. So you may want to compare those to see um, <clears throat> how did they both treat that idea. Also an interesting similarity mm -hmm. to how we mm -hmm. described um, uh, begetting. <clears throat> yes. Mm. Right. Bringing into being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we saw that also in Agathon's speech. Oh. Are we going to go back now, or is it homework? No. No, that's your homework. Okay. <laughs> that is true. Still, as you are aware, they are not called poets. They have other names, while a single section is parted from the whole of poetry. Merely the business of music and meters is entitled with the name of the whole. This and no more is called poetry. Those only who possess this branch of the art are poets. Wow, quite true. Well, it is just the same with love. Generically, indeed, it is all that desire of good things and of being happy. Love most mightily and all beguiling. Yet... Whereas those who resort to him in various other ways, in money-making, in inclination to sports or philosophy, are not described either as loving or as lovers, all those who pursue him seriously in one of his several forms obtain as loving and as lovers the name of the whole. I fancy you are right. And certainly there runs a story that all who go seeking their other half are in love. Though by my account, love is neither for half nor for whole. Unless, of course, my dear sir, this happens to be something good. 
for men are prepared to have their own feet and hands cut off if they feel these belongings to be harmful. The fact is, I suppose, that each person does not cherish, cherish his belongings except where a man calls the good his own property and the bad another's, since what men love is simply and solely the good. Or is your view otherwise? Faith, no. Then we may state unreservedly that men love the good? Yes. Well now, must we not extend it to this, that they love the good to be theirs? We must. And do they love it to be not merely theirs, but theirs always? Include that also. Briefly, then, love loves the good to be one's own forever. That is the very truth. Okay, let's pause now, there for okay. a moment. Sorry. Because um, we're going to go on to a, a new direction from there. So we got a definition here of love, all that desire of good things and of being happy very broad definition. And then here we have one sentence where, where the whole story of looking for our missing half is just cut down. Um, sorry, Aristophanes, she's saying that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the good. And so cut it down in one um, one sentence there, and then moves on. Now, the footnote, by the way, says that it's a prophetic allusion to Aristophanes' speech, because, of course, Diotima had said this many years earlier. Um, I'll leave it to you to decide, was it prophetic or is it artistic license, because Plato wrote all of it. But, um, you know, there are many things, places, actually, where you can look back and say, oh, this is kind of like a reference to something in another speech. And either it, it cuts it down or it puts it in a different context. And, you, and this is part of the um, purification that I was talking about last week. Um, okay, so we have here this conclusion. Love loves the good. Let me highlight it. Love loves the good to be one's own forever. This highlighter is weird. <laughs> Sorry, it's highlighting very broadly. Yeah. And that is the truth. Okay, so that's the conclusion that they have reached so far. Um, I don't want to just be barreling ahead. Do either of you have any comments or questions at this point? We're all on the same page with her so far. We're following her well. I like that. He, that she included sport. I think mm. that there is an excellence that uh -huh. is similar to uh -huh divine inspiration that people can get in sport mm -hmm. and people who love the game play mm -hmm. better and keeps them in mm -hmm. it and keeps them seeking that thing. And they want to uh, keep playing and they don't want to stop a, right. a lot of similarities that I can um, relate to from playing sport. Yeah. We have money making sports philosophy. So many areas, not only philosophy, right? And also when we get to the ladder of loves, the various beautiful things that we see as our objects of love, we'll also see that also, that broadening and the various things that we love. Okay, so now she's going to go into a new direction. And uh, Jacob, could you pick it up from now if love is always for this? Now, if love is always for this, what is the method of those who pursue it? And what is the behavior whose eagerness and straining are to be termed love? What actually is this effort? Can you tell me? Ah, uh, dear Tima, in that case, I should hardly be admiring you and your wisdom and sitting at your feet to be enlightened on just these questions. Well, I will tell you, it is begetting on a beautiful thing by means of both the body and the soul. It wants some divination to make out 
what you mean. I do not understand. I think maybe it wants is self wants. Self wants some divination to make out what you mean. I don't understand. Hmm. Let me put it more clearly. All men are pregnant, Socrates, both in body and in soul. On reaching a certain age, our nature yearns to beget. And remember this... here, again, sorry, uh, just a reminder that beget means to bring into existence. And so it's both men and women who want to beget. Hmm. Th this it cannot do upon an ugly person, but only on the beautiful. The con... Uh, the conjunction of man and woman is a begetting for both. It is a divine affair, this engendering and bringing to birth, an immortal, immortal element in the creature that is mortal. And it cannot occur in the discordant. The ugly is discordant with whatever is divine, whereas the beautiful is accordant. Thus, beauty presides over birth as fate and the lady of travail and hence it is that when the pregnant approaches the beautiful it becomes not only gracious but so exhilarate that it flows over with begetting and brings forth though when it meets the ugly it coils itself close in a sully dismay, rebuffed and repressed, it brings not forth, but goes in labor with the burden of its young. Therefore, when a person is big and teeming ripe, he feels himself in a sore flutter for the beautiful, because its possessor can relieve him of his heavy pangs. For you are wrong, Socrates, in supposing that love is of the beautiful. Whoa, 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 what? What is it then? It is of engendering and begetting upon the beautiful. Ah, so be it. To be sure it is. And how of engendering? Because this is something ever existent and immortal in our mortal life from what has been admitted who needs must yearn for immortality no less than for good since love loves good to be one's own forever and hence it necessarily follows that love is of immortality do you want to pause here for a moment so this last section that we just read here going back to uh, let me put it more clearly. How does this help us with the myth? Or how is this represented in the myth? Take a moment to look it over. Well, if uh, men are pregnant uh, all the time, mm -hmm. then uh, the plenty, plenty guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was already ready to beget uh, when uh, poverty, uh, you know, laid down next to him, resource. Uh, but would he desire if he's already full? No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would, because he's, he's got plenty, he's mm -hmm. resource. Mm -hmm. So it must have been the desire of, of poverty. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, often in stories, especially traditional stories, but even in modern ones, it's usually the man who chases the woman. 
Not in this story, though. Oh, yeah, this one is a, maybe it's a little tricky, um, and it, it may take a little bit of thought, but I, I encourage everyone listening to me now to look over this little speech here and compare it to the myth and go back and forth between them and see what you see. Um, but the, the conclusion here is that love is of immortality. And so this is where it's going from here. And we see here, Socrates says that all this instruction did I get from her at various times when she discoursed of love matters. So they had many different conversations. So very different from Agathon, right, who just kind of ended the whole thing. So his teachings ended right there. But Socrates took it much further, and they had multiple conversations. And then at one time, she picked up the conversation asking, what do you suppose, Socrates, to be the cause of this love and desire? For you must have observed the strange state into which all the animals are thrown, whether going on earth or winging the air, when they desire to beget. They're all sick and amorously disposed, first to have union one with another, and next to find food for the newborn, in whose behalf they are ready to fight hard battles, even the weakest against the strongest, and to sacrifice their lives. To be racked with starvation themselves if they can but nurture their young and be put to any sort of shift, as for men, she said, or humans, one might suppose they do these things on the promptings of reason. But what is the cause of this amorous condition in the animals? Can you tell me? Now, many people who are not Platonists, but who've maybe read this in a university class or so, they come away with this image of love, this lower image, right? Um, oh, so Plato says that we only want to um, hook up with beautiful people, or we, you know, we just want to have babies. And I find it, I find it very interesting how Plato was able to put it all together. You know, even this lowest understanding of love and carry it on to the higher. And that's where D what Diotima is doing now. She's starting at the lowest. Some people stop here, and that's really all they pull out of the dialogue. But um, she's starting here, and she's building. Um, we do have a few more minutes, so maybe we can read a little bit more. Um, Socrates, can you pick it up from once more? I like what you just said about building, and that was the reason why mm. I enjoyed her bringing up sport. Um, mm. uh, it's harder to start conversations about philosophy with regular folk, but it's easier to talk about sport and things because mm. there are some people who have that desire that desire for excellence or, or that moment of inspiration while in playing sport which can be a good lead-in a good uh a stepping stone uh right. like you said to, right. to the higher yes absolutely yeah sports awesome. art music which is also art but um yeah many there are many ways that we express ourselves um and we tend to associate that means of expression with the soul or with love, not realizing that it's just one means of expression. But yes, that could be a doorway into that conversation is to touch on the thing that the person loves. Yeah, yeah and specifically shoot for mm -hmm. um, like a hunter, a aim for mm -hmm. the highest state of mind that they've had in that sport. Um, That's right. Uh, the yes. Australian cricket team mm -hmm. talk about in the, they have their own language. They talk about mm -hmm. being outside of themselves in certain mm -hmm. moments where they like hit a six, which is very good in cricket. There are these mm -hmm. uh, higher states of mind. So as a hunter, go for go yes. for those ones. I find yes to elevate the conversation to be about states of mind and 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 what it is that we're seeking. That's right. Yeah, because most people ignore those states of mind. They focus on scoring the goal when they're in that state of mind. They don't focus on the state of mind itself and realize that's more meaningful. Yes, I was Although amazed. Maybe when some, I... some sports fans may uh, be very angry with me for saying that. <laughs> but... Yes, that's why I was amazed to read, read uh, that particular study on the, uh, the Australian cricket team in which, mm. uh, unfortunately, they, they don't read philosophy, but they've developed their own kind of um, – locker room language to talk about those states of mind. So 
Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great that they are acknowledging, at least acknowledging mm-hmm. it, even if they can't sort of go further with it. Mm. But we yeah. can if we talk to them and we meet them. That's right. Hmm. Okay, let's pick it up from. So once more, I replied, I did not know. Oh, actually, that's not your line. That would be his. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so he doesn't know, and so Diotima is going to continue. How do you design ever to become a master of love affair of love matters if you can form no notion of this? Why something? It's it's why it is. Oh, yes, sorry. Why, it is just for this, I tell you, Diatima, as I stated a moment ago, that I have come to see you. Uh, It's for this I came to see you, because I noted my need of an instructor. Hmm. Come, tell me the cause of these effects, as well as the others that have relation to love. Well, then, if you believe that love is by nature bent on what we have repeatedly admitted, you may cease to wonder. For here, too, on the same principle as before, the mortal nature ever seeks, as best it can, to be immortal. In one way only can it succeed, and that is by generation. Since so it can always leave behind it a new creature in place of the old. It is only for a while that each live or each live thing can be described as alive and the same, as a man is said to be the same person from childhood until he is advanced in years. Yet though he is called the same, he does not at any time possess the same properties. He is continually becoming a new person, and there are things also which he loses, as appears by his hair, his flesh, his bones, and his blood and body altogether. And observe that not only in his body, but in his soul, besides, we find none of his manners or habits, his opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, or fears ever abiding the same in his particular self. Some things grow in him while others perish. And here is a yet stranger fact with regard to the possessions of knowledge. Not merely do some of them grow and others perish in us, so that neither in what we know are we ever the same persons, but A like fate attends each single sort of knowledge. What we call conning implies that our knowledge is departing, since forgetfulness is an egress of knowledge, while conning substitutes a fresh one in place of that which departs and so preserves our knowledge enough to make it seem the same. Every mortal thing is preserved in this way, not by keeping it exactly the same forever, like the divine, but by replacing what goes off or is antiquated with something fresh in the semblance of the original. Through this device, Socrates, a mortal thing partakes of immortality, both in its body and in all other respects. By no other means can it be done. So do not wonder if everything naturally values its own offshoot, since all are beset by this eagerness and this love with a view to immortality. Let's stop the text here, because we're we're at the end here, and I thank you both for your reading. What do you think of this argument? Makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Are about like seeking a uh, kind mm-hmm. of immortality, mm-hmm. but because we're mortal, we can't. Oh, I feel like I'm just paraphrasing what I just read, but yeah, because we're mortal, we can't uh, live forever. There's no way. So we can only uh, 
you know, create a likeness of, of ourselves and, you know, not just humans, but every creature kind of is like that because we're not gods. Yeah, this idea of ever-changing, we've certainly all heard that about the physical body, right? Our hair, flesh, bones, blood, and body all together. He says it's also in the soul. None of our manners or habits or opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, or fears ever adding this, ever abiding the same in his particular self, and even knowledge. What were your thoughts as you, it's one thing to read it about the physical body, quite another about our opinions, but then even knowledge as well. What were your thoughts reading this? Jed, anything to add here? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't like that. Hmm. The opinions, fine. Yeah, you grow and you learn new things. Um, and so, man, your ego, I suppose, your self image even changes body, of course. So your opinions can change and that stuff. But knowledge, I don't like the sound of that because I thought that was one of the things that uh, is lasting. I thought knowledge is immortal. Um, I There are certain things that Socrates says that he knows. <laughs> so does that change? Um, maybe it comes down to the word conning. Is there another word for because we um forget like whatever knowledge that we're seeking and we hope to be immortal we have forgotten in either in our birth or our childhood so maybe this conning has plays a key role is there another translation for conning yeah i'm afraid i don't know that greek word um but we can look at the english here and see how he's defining it Whatever this conning is, it substitutes a fresh knowledge in place of that which departs and so preserves our knowledge enough to make it seem the same. Are so we sure? Like the, mm, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, are we sure that the word knowledge is mm -hmm. the Greek nous? Um, it's not news. What is it? Um, probably episteme. Yes, it's episteme. So one of the ones that normally refers to pure being. Um, it's used in a few different ways here. Um, so it could be that we are adjusting our understanding of knowledge. Or that we're... Um, but a right. fresh one in place of that which departs. Um, it it so could be a raising it. or it could be a lowering, and we're not really clear from this language, which it is. But our insights deepen as we continue on. And you may see the same truth in a more profound way. Like uh, those of us who've been doing this some years, we may feel at some point like, oh, yeah, I really... You even you have some experiences where, like, now you know something. Um, but a few years later, 10 years later, five years later, when you look back, you realize, wow, now I see it in a whole different way. And I thought I really understood it before. And now I see it differently. Um, so there could be a deepening of our knowledge. Um, or if the word knowledge is used in a looser way here, then it could be that we are being forgetful. But here he's distinguishing forgetfulness as an egressive knowledge of ebbing away with conning. And yeah, so it's not really clear how he's using the word conning. You're right. And I, so I, it leaves room. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it brought to mind um, the description in the Phaedo where he says um, our, our senses are all, um, everything in the sense world, in the physical world, he just 
described how the physical world is all in change, but in the Phaedo, he makes the Socrates makes the argument these these changing physical things, they're seeking, they're desiring themselves uh, the immortal, they're desiring um, pure being, but they're falling short. However, it is through um, the the looking at those physical things that are conning us. The uh, he gives a, a two sticks. They kind of look like they're equal, but they're not really equal. If you look close enough, you'll see that they're not exactly equal. They're yes, conning that's you. That's our usual understanding of conning. Right, but conning mm -hmm. you in the sense of um, they are uh, uh, not in a negative sense, but their purpose, because he goes on to say it is only through this looking at the physical world that falls short that we can remember what we once knew immortally before we were born about knowledge as a pure soul. So it's only through this um, tricking or, or, or um, uh, yeah, trick, kind of tricking, but not in a, in a negative sense, tricking of the physical mm -hmm. things that we can remember, recall, recollect uh, our knowledge, and that's what learning is. And he uses that as an um, argument for the immortality of the soul through learning or replacing our knowledge. I don't remember the Phaedo saying that we're tricked. It's more that the um, the appearance of equality, for example, in our physical realm is what causes us to question what is equality itself. Yeah, yes, not yes. tricked, not tricked, mm -hmm. um, because that mm -hmm. would imply that the physical objects mm -hmm. are trying to trick us. But it's, yeah. the, it's the false appearance of equality Mm -hmm. Kind of. So it's it's a really loose word, uh, uh, conning, so to speak, being conned mm -hmm. inadvertently. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how you apply that here, but you gave people food for thought. And um, so you can think about what this arguments, everyone. And um, yeah, many things here. I gave you a lot of homework here, looking at that myth and looking at that other section about immortality and this argument here. Um, anyone um, want to, if anybody wants to um, work through this stuff and drop me an email, I'm happy to comment on it. And we will pick up from this point then next week. So I... Socrates, again, hearing this argument, he wonders more about it and our conversation is going to continue. So that's where we're going to pick it up. But did either of you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I was going to ask, um, you said mm -hmm. that... Uh... Knowledge, the way they're talking about knowledge could be less than immortal in the sense that we see greater depth into it, like develop a greater understanding of the knowledge experience. But um, as humans, by coming back from the experience, immortal experience of, of knowledge or the brilliant light of being, coming back into a human form necessarily we have to let go of that experience. So by virtue of being human, we ha we lose it. And so maybe this, um, uh, the way that they're talking about the, the lack of immortality in the knowledge is only while ensouled. You have to go back and forth and therefore refresh it. Mm -hmm. So it's, so while you can have a knowledge experience like maybe Socrates on the porch before this whole party, you, um, you have to, it's not immortal while you're alive, maybe something along those lines or while you have a body, while you're human, because you have to keep forgetting or coming back. Well, one thing that is from the Phaedo that I, I um, took was that, you know, the soul never like gets it never goes away it the soul is immortal and when he he says here that you know his body does you know it, it is losing it you lose your hair your flesh but um but when he talks about the soul or when it talks about the soul here and it uses conning i kind of took it as like replacing so like 
you're because you can't lose any bit of your soul mm. um so really you're just part part of what made up your soul might you know its pieces could be replaced but they could never be forgotten or like your soul can't diminish i, I think right absolutely the soul does not diminish and then the question is, what do we bring back? I think that's what Jed was asking, is what do we bring back from that experience and how do we hold on to it? Right. And, I also, um, can I add another thing? He, uh, Socrates saying to Diotima, like earlier in the talk you said, um, there's a question of like if Diotima brought Socrates along further, um, does it mean that she's a better teacher? Well, one of the things that stood out to me was the quality of her student. Socrates was saying, whenever uh, Diotima asked a question about love to Socrates, uh, after the initial, hey, by the way, fellow, you're wrong. After that, Socrates was saying, I don't know. I'm, I'm, that's, why, that's why I'm here at your feet. Um, and that's very different to Socrates' friends, who he's teaching. They're all making great speeches, and um, they haven't come along and said, Socrates, I'm here to learn from you. They haven't made that um, declaration and put themselves in that position. So, they're, uh, I was going to say, they're not empty. They're full. They're not empty. Yes, they're full, which is very they're interesting. Mm -hmm. they that's right they're falsely associating with with plenty and not poverty mm -hmm. so when jacob was talking about um these qual the soul being immortal maybe it's the false association with these actually mortal things like your opinions and your thoughts and those sort of things it's the false association that you're missing the mark on that's not really who you are just like they're not really poverty uh plenty their poverty but socrates recognizes it enough to say i've come to you seeking an instructor that's different and that's different from pretty much most of the dialogues that i've read where socrates has to kind of um not convince them but kind of convince them and a little bit that he's worth listening to and he's got something to share we saw that the idea of the double ignorance that um, the gods don't seek wisdom because they truly are full already. And the ignorant don't seek wisdom because they think they're full and they're not. So it's not that they're plen they're poverty. It's that they don't, they, they're not poverty, but they should be. And so that's what you're pointing out that, um, that Socrates did recognize where he was lacking. Yes. And that's interesting because um, last week we mentioned, okay, this is wild because this version of love that Diotima destroyed, prophetically mm -hmm. or not, um, about seeking your other half is one of those things that I see on social media often, um, comically often, <laughs> that love is seeking your other half and blah, blah, blah. She destroyed it. Um, Oh God, I lost my thought. Oh, another thing that I see on, on social media often is uh, Socrates being quoted as saying that he knows nothing and that makes him the wisest, that he doesn't, that the only thing he knows is that he knows nothing, which is also something wrong, but quoted all the time, especially and when somebody wants to. And you're not empty if you are satisfied with knowing nothing. You're not desiring to know because you're not seeking it. You don't, you think that you shouldn't seek it, that I don't have to. Well, I know nothing and I know I know nothing. And so I'm done. That's, yes, that's brilliant because that's, that's, that's how that misquote serves. And that um, being satisfied with not seeking is something alluded to earlier with, uh, with the Amartya. It's Agathon at the end of his speech. He said, oh, that's enough. Like, he's satisfied with just enough. And this is one of the things in one of our early, um, earlier read-alongs, you shared a quote, that one of the things that I know is it's worth seeking. 
even if we don't if we don't know something it's worth seeking even if we don't know we're going to get it or not because that's one of the things so one of the so this misquote of socrates saying all oh, the thing i know is i don't know is wrong because we've got at least a list of four we've got the three that we mentioned uh, last week that um he knows the truth about love that we got from here um from our previous read along that he knows that um, there's a difference between right opinion and understanding um, from the Theotetus. He knows that he's got an art and this one, he knows that it's worth pursuing uh, what we don't know and not just giving up, especially not just giving up because somebody falsely quoted Socrates on a Facebook post. Um, so yeah, I thought that was brilliant that we have uh, an allusion to that fourth thing that we can know and interesting that we're talking about knowledge. You can end it there. Um, I maybe just point out, um, since we're talking about other dialogues as well, I'm not going to go into it here, but you may want to go back to the Theotetus because um, many people have the question about why Socrates says when he's talking about his midwifery that he himself is barren. And um, he's not pregnant. And that leads to a lot of questions, but it also ties into this discussion. Um, but I'm going to... Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's one, one more thing here I that, that I, just, I just really wanted to add. Sorry, I've, I've been taking notes. Um, if Socrates is saying that he uh, is seeking a teacher for diatema and that he doesn't know, so he's associating with poverty, and he's at the feet of diatema, who has the resource... What is Socrates and Diotima begetting themselves? What are they bringing forth? Very good question. You gave yourself a good question. So we'll stop it there. And um, next week, I think we'll be able to finish Socrates' speech. And we'll see that ladder of beautiful objects that lead us up to beauty itself. Okay, so that'll be next time. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section below or drop me an email. Please like the video and also please subscribe if you don't already. And I do hope that you will all join us next week. Thank you very much.